Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective and to the Well of Being. Really nice to be here with you all. Just always feels like such a such a true uh, refuge, you know, like a gift and an opportunity to practice here together. And for me, you know, to kind of have my week circle around this evening, right? And so like preparing my mind, heart and body to be here and um, preparing the teachings and then, yeah, just having a time each week we can show up and be authentic with what is hopefully one of the most important things in our life, which is becoming more deeply who we really are. I love that translation of enlightenment, just becoming more deeply who we really are. Um, and tonight we are going to continue our winding road with this book, Old Path, White Clouds. So the beautiful uh, kind of biographical story of the life of the Buddha. And for those who were here last week, it, you know, it's the Buddha is now in his kind of fine wine stage, right? So he has reached enlightenment over I think 28 years ago, he's been spreading the teachings and they're just getting like richer and more refined and clearer and more refined. And it's such a treat to kind of hear how he is sharing them in new ways to his Sangha. And I also thought it would be interesting and worthwhile for us tonight to unpack our meditation a little bit before we begin. So tonight we will kind of talk about the pieces of meditation that we bring together when we practice, then practice, talk a bit about, again, like a continuation of really trying to understand at, at the deepest levels um, this, this idea that, you know, every dharma is empty. So everything that we experience is actually dependent upon another thing. The emptiness of all dharmas, I think we could spend probably a good six months on it, but it at least deserves one more evening uh, reviewing. So I, I think it's going to be a nice one and a bit more on the conceptual side. So for our practice, I'd really like to think about, you know, the basic stages and phases of how we come into meditation practice. So I'm going to ask us to do a series of experiments. So. First, if it feels comfortable, either having the eyes slightly open or closed. And just noticing at the level of what does it feel like in the body to be here and around other beings right now? And then taking a moment and noticing what does it feel like to be transitioning from whatever we were doing during this day to being here right now. And just gently opening our eyes. And as you do that inquiry. Where are you looking? Like, how do you know? Like, are you looking for sensations in the body? Or how do we know? Like, oh, what is it like to be around others? Do thoughts come up, feelings? Just like, what is she talking about? Like, yeah, like what, what came up for anyone? Please. Um, for me, a combination of thoughts and feelings yeah. come up. And uh, considering that I had a terrible day at work and I'm not very fond of being with others, I uh, the thought that came as well as the feeling both were contradictory. Mm -hmm. And the thought was that um, the same beings that I'm around, including myself perhaps, are the source of my suffering as well as um, support and warmth. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. And when you felt that, was there any kind of like, I don't want to lead you, but like, what did that feel like in the body? Bad, actually. <laughs> I'm trapped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. That could also be a surrender, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, um, 
the dilemma, right? The contradiction that, um, or the dependency. Um, so that that's the part that uh, hurts a bit. Yeah. But um, uh, the warmth is good, but the suffering that is caused is difficult. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And it is that kind of age old question of if what everyone wants is to be happy and feel connected, why is this the world we're living in? <laughs> like, what's going wrong? Like, what are we not getting? And, you know, I think some of that is just not really deeply understanding the true causes of happiness and what can allow us to feel at ease and present uh, with one another. So we um, can end up pursuing paths that really keep us so busy and occupied that we don't find that happiness or can feel like others are in the way. And sometimes they truly are like on their own path, trying to be happy. Anyone else? Where where did you look to, or what were you trying to feel when you're like, yeah, what is it like right now to be around others, or what is it like to transition into this moment? You want to repeat for me? Yeah. I just felt this like when so I've been having this delightful late afternoon hang out with Lindsay here, <laughs> and so when you said what is it like to leave, I felt like literally a physical sensation of holy. Mm. Stepping in, stepping in young, like this, like I was like, I want to keep thinking. Oh, I mean, not even the thought, but just like this, the f yeah, like a physical sensation of that. Yeah, interesting. So Mace is describing there's like a sensation of actually um, pulling an like another being who she's been spending time with this afternoon, and they feel like connected. Yeah. And what about the let go? Was that kind of pulled in there? Wait, is there yet? Okay. Okay. And I bring this up because often we're like, cool, I'm here to meditate, close our eyes, boom, let's go. And we aren't attending to something really fundamental to our practice, which is being able to feel some sense of safety and ease. And this is hard baseline. It is harder and harder when we have disruptions or difficulties in our own life. It is harder and harder with the world and the suffering around us to just do that like shift of like outside world here. Oh yeah, we're good. It's like, I can relax. Truly there is no progress in meditation if we can't feel a sense of kind of existential, very deep relaxation. Not falling asleep relaxation, but a sense of the body is at ease so the mind can be still like fundamental. And I think about this a lot in, you know, how we approach the teachings and what I've learned from many teachers as well. So I've many times shared here um, Sokni Rinpoche's handshake practice with emotion. And Sokni Rinpoche really saw with his students that so many people couldn't do the most kind of simple of practices. I say simple because it's very hard of attending to the breath because they were so distracted by emotional material. So you're settling in, okay, I'm meditating, focusing on the breath, and then like, kind of like, what's gonna happen next week? Or what did I say last week? Or, you know, all this material comes up of our rumination in the past, our rumination in the future. And then we're just like, no, 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 focus. So we get rigid and relaxation, is not rigid, right? We, we know what relaxation feels like. It's kind of like a pliancy of body. So I do think that kind of helping us, especially drawing from the psychological literature, what's quite priming in a sense of feeling connected, a sense of having some kind of secure base within ourself before we practice can be really helpful. And sometimes we can do that through our body, like, oh, yeah, I'm coming home in the body. I feel at ease. I feel safe here. That's not true for all of us. That's not true all the time. But finding that way to also feel that the things that we're holding, like I often have this image in my mind when I'm settling into practice, like I'm holding all of these different threads, all of these different things that you know, are important in my life and are kind of waiting for me on the other side. And that like holding of them creates this subtle energy that I can't actually let go in my mind. 
I can't actually kind of become at ease or relax. So there, you know, in addition to that sense of kind of the physiological sense of like safety or okayness, right? I'm, I'm okay right here. I can relax right here. There's the safety of, I can also relax in my mind. I can relax in my mind so I can be here. I think this is so important. And um, I've been recently reading, I'll, I'll talk about this more next week, but the relationship between our attachment style and meditation and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And for those of you um, who are familiar and, or not uh, with attachment style, it's a really kind of fascinating categorization of the ways that we get harmed and hurt early in our life. And the two big buckets uh, that are often described, there's more, but is a style of someone who feels they don't have a safe base, right? They didn't receive what they needed when they were a little being. And so that kind of translates into their relationship with others in the world. And one of those primary buckets is anxious. And if that's something you relate to or maybe resemble, that's often, you know, a sense of needing to be validated in your love not feeling safe, deep sense of abandonment. And that's in terms of meditation and mindfulness practice associated with a kind of hypervigilance, a rumination, always like, am I getting the love I need? Is it going to be there when I'm, when I'm gone? Like, is that, is, am I okay? Are they okay? This like very um, kind of tight and high energy. Anybody relate to that? You don't have to out yourself, but I will out myself. <laughs> I, I, you know, like whenever I read this stuff, I'm like, yeah, I'm special. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm not. And then the anxious side, which I definitely tend to date, as most of us like do that, you know, um, dance with ourselves is, sorry, not the anxious, the uh, avoidant type is uh, those who, you know, what works or what helps them with that fundamental lack that they were experiencing when they were young is kind of avoiding, distancing, closing, going in, right? So this one person who needs the constant affirmation of being loved and this other person who just wants to not be needed, right? That, that dynamic um, definitely can happen. And I think with the anxious type, you see in the literature that its relationship to meditation is there's like so much thought suppression, kind of like not just not feeling your feelings. And that gets in the way of meditation and mindfulness. So I just found it really interesting in both cases, like really needing a secure base, needing to feel as, you know, the tradition state that I'm basically okay. You could, of course, call it your Buddha nature, like knowing you're good as you are right now. Like that feels, you know, and this is not as much studied in the psychological literature, but you see it across so many great teachers and describing this process of as we deepen in our practice and we become more who we really are, we're also deepening into the sense of intrinsic love, right? And does anybody feel that in their practice occasionally? Just... Right. Like, so it's, it is, it is, and it can heal us, um, which is so beautiful. But often, again, we walk in this door and there's a lot of other momentum coming in here with us. And so I like this idea and I will um, invite us when we enter into practice to really take time to settle into our practice, take time to try to establish a sense of, okay, in my body, am I okay? All right all these little threads I'm hanging on to, can I, can I gently release them for now? And then, you know, just the opportunity and invitation, we can't force it, but is there something intrinsically already good in here? Like always, right? And then, and then practice. It's a big difference. When I take time to do that in my practice, it's a big difference. You know, there's more capacity. And the practice I'd like us to do today, you know, last week, I, I pushed us off the, the steep cliff of clear light. Uh, so I'm going to pull us back in for a moment. Uh, I think I think working with clear light is, is so beautiful. Um, but I was in reflection, like, yeah, we need that stable base first. And to also do these practices of settling the mind in the natural state as we often do, of really noticing and being able to create this very useful distance between 
the mental events in our mind and the space of our awareness. It sounds so simple, but it's so hard. And I think part of the reason it's hard is because like, what does it mean to observe our own mind? So we're gonna do one more experiment here. Eyes open or closed, whatever you prefer. And these are drawing from some classical inquiry questions about the nature of mind. They're meant to be a bit provocative, not totally clear. So give yourself an opportunity to observe the space of mind. Does that space of your mind have a specific color? Does the space of mind have a specific shape? Where is the space of the mind? And then as a little bit of a process to help us identify the space of the mind, what arises within it, we can come up with just a, a simple phrase, something like, I am here in this seat. And silently to ourself, we say it syllable by syllable, noticing where does that thought come from as we're saying it, and noticing where it then dissolves into so taking a moment and finding that simple phrase and noticing where it appears in the mind. And we could try just one more experiment of bringing to mind the last beautiful sunset you saw. And again, noticing where does this image arise from? And once you've seen the image and can release it, where does it go back to? and gently blinking the eyes back open. Okay, anybody have a color? Uh, I got a split screen going on. Okay. <laughs> that side of the orange and that side of the deep purple. Wow, <laughs> beautiful. There, there's no, you know, there's no, right or wrong answer. The questions are really intended to be curious. Like, what do we mean by mind? Like, what is that? What is what is awareness that exists in the field of the mind? And we're so cognitive head oriented that I think most of us believe our entire mind is like here. And in the contemplative traditions, awareness is like boundless. It's, it's all around. So to kind of play with that a little bit. And how how was it trying to bring this, you know, sentence to mind? Did that evoke something coming from somewhere, returning to somewhere else? Yeah. Yeah, I felt like the, the returning, I don't know, I mean, with it, I guess like, when you said, you know, what color is it? I just started thinking of every every color I could possibly think of. There was no like, oh, this is the this is the color of that thing. So yeah. I feel like I was just like cycling for a little while. But then um, I don't know, you said like a picture it was 
sunset, or, you know, it doesn't. And then when I like tucked that image back away, I kind of felt like a deep sense of calm, which was interesting. Like kind of, I almost like a visual, like, uh, you know, when you, you put something in the recycling bin and it kind of like waves and then goes into a little, you know, on the computer, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm not to try it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> whatever um yeah and then but then like a deep sense of calm like it and peace kind of came yeah from like a high kind of like spinning out of <laughs> everything just spinning for yeah. the first you know three quarters of yeah time. yeah beautiful and um for folks online lucas is describing you know at first every color coming to mind and then you know being able to actually find this image of the sunset and also feel it dissolve i guess or like return you could say i think noticing that is so unbelievably special like being able to notice when a thought an image has been released because often we're just like right after the other right right after the other so yes i saw a hand online then it disappeared oh. Hi. Um, so the the questions, the, the those questions and and other questions, that, uh, similar questions. I leave me always saying, I don't know, 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 and I find that kind of a, it hurts my head in a way to, to to, try to, you know, figure it out. So I kind of then let it go because the answer is always, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, and again, I completely am with you and I actually really like disliked these questions for a long time. I definitely thought I was doing it wrong, but the, or like, as I understand them now, it's to really point you to the expectations that you are carrying around what your mind is, the kind of ideas, the implicit and sometimes explicit ideas of what your mind is or isn't. And we're just not that curious. Like we don't have a great vocabulary for what goes on in our mind. We're just like, yeah, I'm thinking, tired, hungry, right? <laughs> Maybe we have some emotion words, but so it's really like this kind of provocation of what the heck is this mind? Like what is consciousness, right? Um, and I think it's, yeah, it is it is that level. It, there's like, it's a good kind of irritation, like the irritation that comes before there's discovery. Like I want to know. Like what I hear you is like, I want to know and I don't know. And it's, you know, taking that energy of like the wanting and applying that to really observing the mind. And in the practice, we'll be doing the settling the mind in its natural state. You know, I've I've used a couple metaphors um, uh, for that. And, you know, one is, you know, imagining that there's kind of a, a big curtain as though you were on, a, there was a stage in front of you and the thoughts come from behind the curtain and they return back to the curtain. And we learn to observe in that way. Or we're like the hawk up at Twin Peaks kiting against the wind, right? And we can just have the stream, endless stream of thoughts going through, but our, our awareness remains still. Um, I think I'll use that one tonight because I, I like that idea of the stillness of our awareness amid the movement of thoughts, right? And feeling that, right? Like, again, where are the thoughts moving? They're not in literal space, but yeah. So thank you for your um, reflection on that. I'm sure you're not alone. It's very annoying. <laughs> sorry and not sorry. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, epic preamble. Uh, if folks want to stand up and stretch, and then we're going to do a practice together. <laughs> Yes. 
I'm so entrained in the Tibetan style. It's usually 24 minutes, which is a gatika. It's like a, it's just how Tibetan, many Tibetan lineages practice on the 24 minutes. And just as a reminder, um, of course, seated, seating on the floor, also standing. If we become sleepy, I know the time change is so real. Um, and it's totally okay if you fall asleep in practice. You know, it it does kind of, it can energize a sense that practice is about dullness and not about vividness. So you're welcome to stand up for a moment to like regain the brightness. So before we get started, and um, for our friends at home, this will be kind of oriented towards us. But before we get started as part of that aspect of just kind of taking in this space as a way to feel connected and more at ease, you don't need to look around, meaning making eye contact, but just like looking around at this space before we start to just be like, okay, this is where I am. There's other people here. Just like this is actually one of the beautiful trauma-informed strategies you find for practicing. Just really helping us feel in this space, in this place. And taking a moment and attending to our posture. So first of all, right off, finding that sense of an upright spine. That dignity and length of the spine. We might even feel this the slightest pull of the top of our head upwards. And finding a place for the palms to rest on the lap that allow the shoulders to feel at ease. Feeling and allowing there to be plenty of space around the midline so the air can freely flow in and out. And feel and imagine just a slight upturning of the heart. And deeply soften around the eyes, around the upper eyelids and the lower eyelids. Softening the forehead and the brow. as we ring the bell to get started, allowing your attention to follow the full resonance of the bell as it arises in the space of awareness, as it slowly dissipates and fades. And for those of us who are here in the center, orienting to the sounds around us and knowing we're protected.
and to help our nervous system just calm and relax and find a little more presence. We're going to take some longer inhales and then exhale through the mouth, just really releasing and relaxing. So inhale, drawing in. And exhale, release. Twice more, extending the inhale. And fully exhaling. One more time. I'm taking a moment and noticing what's here in the body at the level of emotional resonance from the day. Feeling and imagining almost that our body was a map, and the cartography of different feelings throughout. Maybe we feel some areas of worry, some areas of ache, And feel and connect to a sense of just basic welcoming. Everything here is okay. And without forcing, seeing if there can be a bit of release by attending with this kindness towards these different areas in the body. And for a couple breaths, just continue really noticing and meeting and shaking hands with sensations in the body associated with our feelings and experiences of the day. No conceptual content, not thinking about what happened or why. Just meeting and bringing that kindness and welcoming for whatever is here. And then shifting our attention and awareness for one more phase and stage of release and connection, caring. Taking a moment and just noticing what we might be carrying in the terms of to-dos. It's probably impossible to bring all of those to mind. But instead, bring an attitude of allowing them to just sit right by us, as though we were carrying a heavy load and we just put it down. Just give yourself this invitation of not engaging with anything that needs to get done for the next period of time together.
and taking a moment now and noticing that we have shown up in our body and considered our sensations and feelings, the emotional residue, invited this generosity of being fully here. Is there any part of us that can feel a sense of goodness, okayness? This might feel like just a really humble little flame inside of us. That goodness that brought us here tonight, that goodness that keeps on inspiring us to transform. And for a couple moments, really connecting to that sense of goodness that's always already here. If it's hard to feel it right now, maybe we remember what it was like as a child. Some part of us that was just good. And as Thich Nhat Hanh would beautifully say, allow that to be a smile on the heart. Now we'll shift our attention and awareness to the breath. Allowing the natural rhythm of the breath and following the sensations of breath as they travel in through the nostrils. And travel back out through the nostrils. And returning, returning, returning every time. Each time we get distracted and return, we could almost feel a sense of rejoicing, truly building the very essential tools for stabilizing the mind. So following each breath as though our life depended on it, as though our happiness depended on it. Gently shifting now, widening the aperture of our attention to the whole field of tactile sensation in the body. It's 
still aware of our breathing, we bring more of our attention to noticing the sensations throughout the body. Especially noticing how sensations arise and pass away. And feeling sensation as just sensation, though we may know that it's an itch or a yawn, really being in the pure experiencing of sensation.
Sorry, we lost you. Oh. Glad you're back. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thoughts, questions, reflections. Before we do so, just a, uh, a reminder. So wonderful that we have often many of the same people coming here and also new folks coming here every time and people returning we haven't seen in a long time. It's nice to see you. Um, but just as a reminder that in the Dharma Collective, right, part of what allows us to gather here together is a real honoring of and respecting of um, both what we are saying, kind of our speech, and, and also how we're listening. So engaging in this compassionate speech and engaging in compassionate listening. Uh, a lot of that has to do with bringing our practice into everyday life. I think always there's a question of like, how does this relate to the world, this thing I do with my eyes closed? Um, and I think a lot of what we get to do here together when we're in discussion is practice, how do we bring the ethics of non-harming and the ethic of essentially like using everything as kind of opportunity for learning and opening and growing. It can be really difficult in our day-to-day -day life to not kind of immediately respond, immediately react and have judgment. But the goal here with one another is to use it as a practice place where when people are speaking and sharing, we kind of hold them like they're little Buddhas, right? And when we are speaking and sharing, really feeling a sense of not judging ourselves either and the generosity of sharing um, into the space so that folks can hear uh, your thoughts and reflections. So with that, anyone like to share? Anything you noticed, any questions? Yes, please. Um, I was one of the sleepy ones <laughs> for sure. Um, and found myself kind of dozing and then coming back to and like, oh, I'm falling asleep. I'm doing that thing. But it was then kind of right away. There was a sense of like compassion about it. That was kind of nice. Yeah. Like, oh no, this is that chance again to just allow myself to be here. And I, I probably will kind of maybe start dozing again. And so it was kind of just going back and forth like yeah. that of opening my eyes, closing them and just sort of allowing myself to kind of try different things throughout the practice to try to kind of stay present, but yeah. being, uh, using it as an opportunity to just kind of be forgiving of yeah. myself. It was nice. Sweet. Um, can I ask, do you, do you generally practice in the morning or like earlier times? Um, yeah, I do. I'm also just tired today. But <laughs> I know. It, it's so tough. Sometimes when we're tired, still helps, like for sure, right? Even if it is like sleepy meditation. I think, the again, the only risk of sleeping or falling asleep when we practice is that we start to kind of energize that pathway of like falling asleep. And people, especially when they do like longer term retreat, I've heard people talk about over the course of, let's say like a year long retreat, you can get in like such a stuck habit of like every time you practice, you're like, mm -hmm you know and uh and you're getting like plenty of sleep right because nothing else is going on um so but when we have we, we are really tired and and i do at home you know it's I, I don't know about other folks here i find it hard to want to practice at night at home like i'm just like oh it's like the last thing but we can get a lot from like supine practice so laying flat that's not in all the traditions but um Was lying down and to give ourselves it's different than going to bed right so just this practice of really being so another opportunity anyone else other what we give ourselves that space before we practice I just want to mention Wait. online, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty for the online people, and uh, Dharma Collective is working on this. 
Yes, but thanks. Can, I can still see your hands. And so we, maybe Eve can as well. So if you have something to say, we'll do our thing. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so it was really nice to um, just kind of settle into the practice, um, especially because before this, um, we were at Rosamunde, which was really nice, but it was like really loud and where there was friends, good times, but then just to come here and it's like, well, we have to step into meditation now. Um, and I was, as I was doing the meditation, I was noticing more and more, I'm trying to really listen mm. um with the entire body or with all the sensations so yeah. what am i what am i hearing what am i seeing with my eyes closed um and realizing that you know i have this image of my brain which is like the physical yes matter and kind of like thoughts going through that <laughs> and then when i talk and then when i'm trying to figure out what mind is you know, it's not of the brain, so it's not, it doesn't have a, um, mm. a beginning or an end, but I can't place it. You know, it's kind of like, it's just, it's just there. And then beyond that, yeah, I can recognize my awareness. So kind of like the awareness that I can see, not see what I can, you know, when mind is working, I'm aware of that. And I'm wondering like, where does that awareness begin mm -hmm. and where does it end? And I don't think I'm going to find the answer to that one pretty soon. Well, so. Buddha has some ideas, but the, but it's, it's a, it's timeless, beginningless, endless, and deathless. And that again, as words is like, Oh, that sounds cool. But as like a feeling is, you know, like Claudia last week, I don't know if you all remember, she was, she did find a little clear light. She was able to practice in clear light. She's like, like time disappeared just so beautiful that they're and again this is not metaphysical it's just time is a construct right and so and we are we are like totally bound up in it like we're trapped in it and when we let go let go let go but don't lose vividness but let go let go and vividness no time you know no beginning no end and we can feel that as part of who we are not like, again, some metaphysical thing that will happen when we become enlightened. So thank you so much. I was going to say, I find the best meditation practices that I, or the best sits, it's when I don't give myself a time. And, you know, sometimes I'll say, okay, I'm going to sit for 10 minutes, 15 minutes or whatever it is. But when I just sit and just kind of tell them, so when my body tells me or something tells me, um, sometimes I surprise myself because it's like, whoa, you know, I'm sitting for a long time. But, yeah. Um, yeah. It's really nice. Thank you. Yeah. And I do think it's funny, you know, we can really um, get in the habit of kind of anthropomorphizing our brain, especially with the preponderance of neuroscience and meditation and, and the worlds that I um, travel in. It's a lot of desire to really understand all the functioning of the brain and then apply that to our experience, which I think is funny because neuroscience is amazing, but it really can't tell you how you feel. Right. Like that has to be your subjective experience. And, you know, the most powerful contemplative science is the science of introspection, really learning your own mind. And that includes like learning when we feel tired. Right. And learning when we are like, oh, my God, I'm being compassionate to myself when I'm tired, which is like a huge win instead of like, oh, right. So that introspection of really like tracking our mind. Yeah. Very beautiful. Anyone else? Yes. It felt um, like as I was sort of hovering, it felt like the thoughts as they were coming by that felt like each one was a sort of a little, a little narrative or a little story or a little identity. So there's, you know, I'm flying off tomorrow. So there's this guy who has to think about what he's packing tomorrow. And, and then my aunt just had, you know, diagnosed with a disease. And mm. So there's a guy who, so that it feels like there's all of these different like yeah. stories I can sort of jump into and different people mm. that I can be. And then when I sort of, um, pause for a moment and not do that it feels it does it I mean, it's, it's hard for me to describe it it doesn't feel clear and spacious it feels kind of 
um, like there's something missing. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost like I'm not, I'm not an I particular like identity or something. So it feels almost a little bit like lonely or something. Like yeah. all of these things that I spend all my time doing yes. that they're not around anymore. So what what's left? So it just sort of felt a little bit. It wasn't unpleasant or disorienting or scary, but it was. It felt a little lonely actually. Yeah. yeah. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And that is often described as the feeling of groundlessness. Yeah. And and groundless, again, just a concept and a word, but the groundlessness is like when we lose like such a tight holding on to our reference points, right? right? Or like who I am and what I need to do. And that, and it can be people describe it as shaky. Right. You know, like, oh, like, well, then who, like, and what and whoa, you know. Um, and I think it's really wonderful. I think sometimes you can get pushed into that groundlessness too quickly by really intensive forms of practice or maybe in psychedelic medicine without proper preparation. And that can feel terrifying, mm -hmm. overwhelming, and really kind of um, mess up what is an important thing, which is our little identity project. Like we need it to move through the world, right? We got to get on a plane and we got to care about our loved ones. But they're finding the porousness or finding the emptiness, right? And not emptiness as in there's nothing, but the emptiness as in, well, I'm only that person going on a plane as like one part of who I am. Then there's these other parts of who I am. And there's up, like that dynamic interrelationship of who we are that's created by all our, like all the many interdependent, the idea like no solid fixed talk. Right. That's what emptiness that they were talking about in the sitting last week about it's all is empty. No, it's not. Yes. But, okay. Yeah. That's helpful. No, really beautiful to have you describe that. I think it's um yeah, really interesting to start kind of yeah, it's like finding the space between the words on the page and being like, whoa, <laughs> there's anyway. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, because I was trying to figure out how to ask that, because what Lama Sulcham has been saying is that emptiness is the emptiness of boundaries. Mm. It's the interrelatedness of mm. all things. Beautiful. And um, just, yeah, what was really beautiful was uh, I had the sense of sensing. I discovered a new sense. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, and, and just on a practical note, I was able to, well, just real quick, last week I was so excited about doing Dia de los Muertos, and then my phone died. <laughs> but it never even occurred to me that I would not go volunteer to help make the altar mm. that was going to happen first and i was just like yeah my phone is dead whatever and it, it kind of made cutting the heads off marigolds and listening to um dancers rehearse mm. all the sweeter because it's just like yeah screw my phone <laughs> but then i had to go deal with the phone mm. um and i couldn't warranty my phone i didn't get to go to deal with deal with low smart toast so i mm. had to deal with the phone and now I have this thing that literally <laughs> on my way over here, it made me want to cry. Mm. But instead, I welcomed it mm. just now. Mm. And yeah, that's what it is. Thank you. Yeah, these phones. I love that idea of recognizing sensing. Again, it's like, and this isn't just for, you know, intellectual interest or like, oh, wow, like I reckon it's this helps us so much. Like what is in the way of us becoming who we truly are, being caught up in rumination, rumination and fixation about what I should be doing and what I need to be and, you know, um, judging others, right? And it's unbelievable how out of control this thing that's called our mind is, right? Alan Wallace calls it, he says, obsessive compulsive delusional disorder, you know, like our obsession with our thoughts our compulsion, right, to keep thinking, our delusion that those thoughts are real, right? Like that keeps us, you know, that's his, um, that's his description of it. And I, I really, you know, I feel it. And that's why it's, it is so special when we get these glimpses in meditation of 
watching, like feeling the sense of sensing or noticing the thoughts. I don't know. There's just um, a real power there. And it does like not just happen in our meditation practice throughout the day. I know I said this last week, but throughout the day, you can like find a moment of clear light or a moment of awareness. It's really tough. I know that like productivity is definitely one of the uh, churches that I, um, you know, adhere to and wanting to get things done, wanting to get things done. But even those really small little like kind of interstitial moments can make such a big difference in our awareness and understanding. So, any interstitial? Uh, interstitial. It's a big word. In between. What? In between what? In between. It just means in between. It's in between. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a fancy, nice word. So I, I, it's, it's really great that just through the practice, we're kind of um, on this. And I want to just come back a little bit. Again, chapter 65, neither full nor empty. No problem if you weren't here, because it's in good ways and bad ways, extremely redundant. So <laughs> um, just as a reminder, we have Ananda, who's kind of the one of the Buddha's assistant who has this photographic memory and the monks have asked him to represent them and ask some specific questions to the Buddha that they're struggling with. Um, and Ananda says, um, some scholars and leaders of other religious sects claim that monk, the monk Gautama teaches nihilism. They say you lead people to negate all life. Do they misunderstand you because you say that all dharmas are empty? And um, the Buddha answers, Ananda, these scholars and leaders of other sects do not speak correctly about this. I've never talked, I never taught nihilism. I've never led others to deny life. Among false views, there are only two, or there are two which entangle people the most. The views of being, um, the views of being and the views of non-being. The first view regards all things having a separate permanent self-nature, and the second regards all things as illusion. If you're caught in either view, you cannot see the truth. And you know, Again, I always am appreciating the context of the time in which the Buddha was living in, in which there are so many other religious groups with so many different doctrines and ideas. And the Buddha at this phase and stage, there's a lot of jealousy to the amount of financial support and students that he has. So there's kind of a lot of um, bad talking against the Buddha. And this idea of kind of the nihilism or the false uh, like these false views. I think it's quite interesting. This view that nothing absolutely matters or nothing is real, that's a very extreme side. It is one that I can see people fall into when they think too much about almost like the overwhelming complexity of the world that we live in, the overwhelming complexity of um, suffering and difficulty. Like when we think of nihilism, it's a belief that absolutely nothing we do matters. I practiced that belief when I was in high school. I don't know if anybody else did, right? Where it's just, you don't care, right? There's almost an aloofness and a callousness with it. And there's part of it that can seem so real because like, it doesn't feel like a lot we do matters. There's so many forces that make it feel like nothing matters, but it isn't actually true. Every single thing we do matters. And right, according to the law of karma, it's not just what we do. Our thoughts matter, right? Our speech matters. Like everything we are engaging with has its own momentum and kind of creates what we'll be experiencing in the future and impacts everyone around us. And then this idea, right, of the permanent and fixed self, as though anything that we achieved or anything that we earned or everything, anything that we cared about was just ours, uniquely ours. That view has created just such a profound sense of individualism, right, in our contemporary culture. Um, 
And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> When we see into the true nature of reality, we're no longer bound by these views. A person with a clear view understands the process of birth and death in all dharmas. Because of that, they're not disturbed by thoughts of existence or non-existence. When suffering arises, the person with a clear view knows that suffering is arising. And when suffering fades, the person with a clear view knows that suffering is fading. The arising and fading of all dharmas does not disturb the person with a clear view. The two false views of permanence and illusion are too extreme. Dependent co-arising transcends both extremes and dwells in the middle. And so just as a reminder, this idea that in order for us to really understand this idea of emptiness, we have to understand what I think Lama Sultram was calling the breaking down of all boundaries between anything, this interdependence. So, you know, last week he defines dharmas, which is confusing because dharma or the dharma collective, right? That is a reference to the word teaching, but he is using the word dharma to describe everything that we hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. Like everything that constitutes what we believe and we feel in the world how we are sensing and experiencing the world. That is all the dharma. So the 18 realms, the sense organs, the sense objects, and then, you know, what we then feel into them. What gets so tricky, of course, is we very rarely are having pure experiencing or very rarely just hearing or sensing or smelling. We're imposing our view upon it. And so when we say that there's actually an emptiness, it means that, again, this is because that is. There is a relationship. Everything we experience, we might have a unique and simple view, but actually it is so connected to every other thing. And he goes on here to describe a bit more about dependent co-arising. He says, being and non-being are concepts which do not actually accord with reality. Reality transcends the boundaries of such concepts. An enlightened person is one who has transcended the concepts of being and non-being. Not only are being and non-being empty, but birth and death are empty. They are merely concepts. If, and then Ananda asks, if birth and death are empty, um, why have you often said that all dharmas are impermanent, constantly born and dying? That is at the relative level, Ananda, the conceptual level. We speak of dharmas being born and passing away. But from the point of view of the absolute, all dharmas are by nature birthless and deathless. So such a hugely important point, because all of the ways that especially these classic ideas are described, it's two levels, the absolute and the relative. Many of you know that here. So for example, with bodhicitta, our awakened heart. Absolute bodhicitta is we have no boundary between our love of, you know, the closest person in our life and someone we've never met. Like we have such pure care and love for all beings that we even decide in our next lifetime, we will come back and liberate more beings, right? Like just this extreme sense of caring without any barrier. Then there's relative bodhicitta. Right, which most of us have to practice every day to try to be like a bit kinder to ourselves and others. So this kind of relative idea of emptiness and then the absolute idea of emptiness. And so at the relative level, you know, things, you know, things are always coming and going and shifting and changing. But at the absolute, there's this birthless and deathless nature. And he goes on to describe exactly what that is. Um, it's essentially the process of, of transforming. So he says, all these dance, uh, dharmas transform into different dharmas. That's all. The Bodhi seed is the same. This is a, the seed of the Bodhi tree. The seed did not die. It transformed into a tree. The seed and the tree are both birthless and deathless. The seed and the tree, you and me, everyone here, the Dharma hall, the leaf, a moat of dust, a trail of incense, are all without birth and death. So this idea, again, that kind of 
when we're talking about there being no birth and death, we're just talking about the reality that energy is always transforming. And that so much of the suffering of birth and death is like fixating on, I will end and this is like, or this ends and this starts. And this kind of flexibility that we can have, this kind of emotional flexibility when we really see that everything is actually changing all the time, transforming, not ending. And then he says, this is a beautiful metaphor. Have you ever stood on the seashore and watched the waves rise and fall on the surface of the sea? Birthlessness and deathlessness are like the water. Birth and death are like the waves. There are long waves and there are short waves, high waves and low waves. Wave rise, waves rise and fall, but the water remains. Without water, there could be no waves. The waves return to water. Waves are water. Water is waves. Though the waves may rise and pass away, if they understand that they themselves are the water, they will transcend, transcend notions of birth and death. They will not worry, fear, or suffer because birth of birth and death. <clears throat> the contemplation on the empty nature of all dharmas is wondrous. It leads to liberation from all fear, worrying, and suffering. It will help you transcend the world of birth and death. Practice this contemplation with all your being. So I just, again, I just love this, the simplicity here that birthlessness and deathlessness are like the water, birth and death are like the waves. So this kind of ongoing continuity of form and matter and life and energy, like that is, everything is arising from that and returning to that, like that is, um, that is how all of our experiences are coming into being. And as such, it's, there's that constant movement, that constant undulation. There's not a beginning and an end. There's not a birth and a death. And that to really feel that sense of contemplating the empty nature of everything shouldn't lead us to nihilism. It should actually lead us to this deep sense of confidence, of interconnection, interbeing. So that is the end of that chapter. And I'm curious, yeah, I know it, it's still like, I think it's a deceptively simple concept, but questions or comments on, again, this idea of the emptiness of all dharmas and how reflecting on the emptiness of all dharmas can lead to our liberation. Yeah. I just like one question, um, like on the, you know, I guess like philosophy of nihilism. I mean, were there any specific sects or like religious groups that were sort of like pushing, you know, I guess like a suicidal or maybe like a, I don't know, I mean, maybe like a more violent, I mean, if like if there's like, you know, sort of like oppressive, you know. Yeah. Um, forms of, you know, like were, were there any groups that were sort of like pushing or like injecting this sort of like, Thought yeah, there. I mean, the only ones I know of, like from this book, and there might be more. And, and Buddha tried this himself, like in the seven years that since he left, you know, his palace and sought the way. For three of those years, he practiced self mortification. So this idea that the way to find enlightenment is by kind of, you know, just dissing the body like like the body is the source of all our delusion we got to get rid of the body and so ate only like the minimum of what was needed to eat like you see these sculptures of him in, in like thailand and other places and he's just emaciated he's like a total skeleton and he tried to deny the body so so that self-mortification was really common in terms of taking life, I, I don't know, but again, that kind of denial of the body. And then the nihilism is interesting. Like, yeah, what would the nihilism look like um, other than punk rock in like a collective setting, right? Or in like a um, a community? I'm not quite sure. Anarcho nihilists are like sort of individually like violent towards society. So I, right. yeah, I don't know. Later, but yeah, I was just wondering, like, where did that sort of like philosophy 
come from or I mean, or is it just the opposite of what, you know? Yeah, I it's, know. yeah. No, I think it's interesting. And, um, you know, I don't, again, I don't know what all the practices were other than that severe asceticism, right. you know, which is a real rejection of like all material culture and society, which like feels pretty reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> like, given what society and culture have given us in a lot of ways but did you have a oh just to remind us to use the microphone oh. yes because if we don't use microphone our friends online can't hear us yep okay. sorry thank okay. you okay. yeah all right Got it. any other yes please can someone pass the microphone to jorge okay so the um, the two extremes the self-centeredness and the disconnect, they're pretty much both disconnecting, right? Right. And when we meditate, we're reconnecting. Yeah. So I, I had a teacher once that told me um, some imagery about um, these Buddhist figures with swords. Mm. And the, I guess the metaphor behind it is they're cutting through the delusion. Yes. So it's, um, so I mean, I, I still, for some reason, um, hold on to the nihilistic view, mm. or but it's like as I've been meditating more and more, but you know it, it, it goes back and forth. You know, like yeah, I'm stepping into two worlds. You know, yeah. <laughs> so that's just like um, I don't know. I just wanted to make that comment. That's so beautiful, and I, I love that idea of like meditation is actually connecting you back into being you know like that and that both of those are you know buddha says the denial of reality right um not because there isn't some times in which probably a lot of the thinking that goes into your nihilism is real right but it's not the entire reality and i think that's where we get caught in our kind of polemicals where we're like it's all this way and it's all that. And I don't know what it is about the human mind. Like we really want it to be one way or the other. <laughs> this gray area is very awkward, you know? Um, and I love that image. I actually, that's what I have here around my neck, which is like a cutting through the delusion. And it's often, this one has a little skull. So cutting through the delusion of permanence with impermanence, like really remembering you know, as we were doing in the weeks leading up, remembering that we're going to die. Right? So whatever it takes to cut through the delusion, right, of, oh, I'll have more time, I'll meditate later. It's, it's really tough, right? And again, not the feeling that we have to meditate because that's what's good. But I think, um, and as you described so beautifully, most of us see that meditation can bring us to a place where we can be more available for ourselves and then for the world, which is, I, that is absolutely what we're here for. So thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes. Uh, um, and there's a book called The Art of Happiness. Yes. I'm Dr. And Howard Dr. Cutler. Dalai Lama. Yes. Who? Howard Cutler. Oh, okay. And, um, the doctor said that somebody asked the Dalai Lama if he could like learn a meditation, and he said that he was this person was too old to learn the meditation, so he killed himself to become a younger person to start the meditation. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think that was a nihilistic comment, <laughs> but we'll let it we'll let it slip. I don't. I actually don't. I don't know. I don't remember that from the book, but the book came out in like two thousand too a long time ago so the he said the dalai the La, dalai lama told this person you can't meditate because you're too old um that was a certain meditation uh, he said he was too old to start the practice uh, yeah. right and then the doctor asked if the dalai lama felt bad and he said no yeah he was like that's just reincarnation will happen so it's fine he's not guilty right i think it was the chapter about guilt hmm yeah. Hmm. What does it mean to you? Oh, uh, there's different cultures. That, that's what I think about it. Yeah. It just reminded me of what you said. Yeah. Oh, I see. They're like, why would someone actually go so far as to take their own life because of belief? Right. Yeah. 
him. I hope that he was able to do what he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. It does seem a bit extreme. And some of the practices, you know, that people undertake do require, I think, to become a geshe. I don't know if folks know that. It's like a equivalent of a PhD in, in scholarly practice, something like 12 or 16 years, which makes me feel like our PhD system is really mellow uh, of intensive practice. So there, there are a lot of commitments. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it would be great for us to reconnect to what we do the practice for, so to dedicate our merit. So taking a moment and just coming back to the body and the breath. Noticing if there's any shifts or changes in the body since when we first arrived here. And if it feels comfortable placing the hands together at the chest as a symbolic gesture and offering and recognizing that what we are here together to do, and that is to deepen and forge the inner resources, the heart, so that we can be available and we can be of service. And if there's any benefit of our time here together, we offer that up. And send this an inspiration and aspiration that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could be healthy and strong. All beings could be free. Thank you all.